Good morning, church. Whether you are worshiping via this method for the first time or you've been with us since the beginning of COVID, you are most welcome. This morning, as I lead us through our worship, I will be sharing scriptures from this version of the Bible. It's called Walking the Good Road, and it is a First Nations version of the Bible. And the First Nations would be, um, sometimes we call them Native Americans, um, Aboriginal people, uh, Indians, and this this is a translation that is put together by, by actually quite a few tribes and with a lot of input and a lot of reflection. And I've been reading some of this during our journey through the Bible and the way that it contextualizes these ancient words in the words of, um, of, of the First Nations people is just a beautiful thing. And it's, and it's also so good because it kind of startles me at times because I'm so used to the way certain words or certain uh, Bible passages are. And so I invite you into that, into that this morning. One of the themes of our service is how God is with us. And um, sometimes that can be a scary thing to think of God always being with us. But also it is ultimately such a comfort because we know that we belong, that we are God's people and God is with us and will not leave us. And so I'd like to begin this morning by sharing the first few verses of the Gospel of John. Long ago, in the time before all days, before the creation of all things, the Word was there, face to face with the Great Spirit. This Word fully represents Creator and shows us who He is and what He is like. He has always been there from the beginning, for the Word and Creator are one and the same. Through the Word, all things came into being, and not one thing exists that He did not create. Creator's life shined out from the Word, giving light to all human beings. This is the true light that comes to all the peoples of the world and shines on everyone. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it or put it out. And finally, from verse 14, Creator's Word became a flesh and blood human being and pitched His sacred tent among us, living as one of us. We looked upon His great beauty and saw how honorable He was, the kind of honor held only by this one Son who fully represents His Father, full of His great kindness and truth.
please say with me these opening words. Triune God, you have called us to live in unity with each other and with all your people throughout the world. Help us to sense that our love for Jesus binds us together. May our worship today be a witness to the kind of unity that comes only through Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let's sing of our good and gracious God with the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And now I invite you to receive God's blessing to you. And God's blessing is God's good word, God's gift to us. And this is how we receive a gift, with open hands, trusting in the goodness and the beauty of what we'll receive. So hold out your hands as I say these words. Grace and mercy and peace be yours from our Creator who made us in love for love from Jesus, who is the embodiment of that love, and from the Holy Spirit, who is a sign and a seal and a promise of that love that will never end until it comes to fullness. May you live in the knowledge, heart, mind, and spirit of that love. And we are made in community, not just by ourselves. Thanks be to God and God's wisdom and uh, God's good ways. And so during this time when we would normally 
it's hard to remember now almost turn and greet each other and uh, shake each other's hands or give each other a hug we invite you to to reach out in the ways that have become more familiar to us now through texts and emails and phone calls and porch visits and if there are other ways we'd love to hear about them so as we reach out to one another in this way let's remember that we do so in the love of God. Although it might seem a little backwards, it is precisely because God loves us and we can rest and count on this love that we can come to this time of confession. Hear these words from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. And this is God speaking to God's people. Come, let us sit down in the council house together. Then face to face, you can hear what my heart is saying. Your bad hearts and broken ways have stained your spiritual garments, a stain so deep you cannot wash them clean. But this is what I will do for you. I will take your blood red garments and wash them until they are as white as snow upon the branches of the cedars. I will wash away the deepest stain until you are as clean and white as the tail feathers of an eagle. In this assurance already, let's come to God in our prayer of confession. God of grace, we grieve that the church, which shares one spirit, one faith, one hope, and one calling, has become a broken communion in a broken world. The one body spans all time, place, race, and language. But in our fear, we have fled from and fought one another. And in our pride, we have mistaken our part for the whole. Yet we marvel that you gather the broken pieces to do your work, that you bless us with joy, with growth, and with signs of unity. Forgive our sins and help us to commit ourselves to seeking and showing the unity of the body of Christ. In his name, amen. And here, this assurance of pardon from the epistle, the letter to the Ephesians. Chapter one, verses seven through eight. By paying the highest price, offering his own life blood, the chosen one released us from the great captivity caused by our bad hearts and broken ways. He poured out all of this overflowing kindness on us, showing how wise and understanding he is. In Jesus' name, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's sing together.
God has blessed us. And although maybe it's hard to think and count those blessings at times, it's a good discipline, a good practice to do that. Um, gratitude, that is being grateful or thankful for something, makes us more grateful. And so as we remember this time of offering, of offering back our financial gifts, we remember too that we get to live a life of gratitude to God, our God who gives us good gifts, who is with us in all things, and will see us and all things through to the most glorious end. And so as we remember giving our financial gifts, let's pray this prayer. Gracious God, everything we have comes from you. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and the service of your kingdom. Amen. We get to continue this time of blessing with the children's blessing. And um, we invite you children to receive this blessing when we, the adults say it. But I also, once you have received that blessing, when we say, um, the Lord be with you, and you receive it like this, you can turn your hands and say, and also with you, because you then are blessing us, and we will do this. And so, people of God, what is our prayer for these children? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen, and thanks be to God. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm recording this Prayer of God's People on Thursday evening. And in our fast-moving world, I know that a lot has happened since Thursday and Sunday. So I will leave space during this prayer for you to include those things that have happened since Thursday evening. It occurred to me that it's been a long time since we at Sherman Street have been able to say the Lord's Prayer together. So today's prayer of God's people will be centered around the Lord's Prayer. Before I begin, I'd also like to say that if you need individual prayer, please feel free to contact any of the elders or our pastors. I will say the Lord's Prayer. Please join me. And then I will say it line by line. You can join me on those lines. And then I will interject some things in between them. And then we'll say it once more at the end. So three times through the Lord's Prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we praise you for who you are. You are our shield and our deliverer, our fortress and our rock. You are the creator of everything, the ruler of all and perfect in all your ways. You are the father of mercies, abounding in love and slow to anger. Your kingdom come. We declare that your name is holy. It is the name that is above every name. 
Today, we bow our hearts in submission and pray that you will help us remove all of the things that want to take your place in our hearts. We endeavor to live to magnify your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We submit to your will. We don't have the power, the strength, the wisdom, or the authority to lead our lives according to your will without your spirit. And clearly, we've botched it. Our environment is hurting. The world is reeling from a deadly pandemic. Millions of people live under the terrors of war. Our own nation is in the midst of a divisive election. Businesses are struggling. People need jobs. We still can't figure out racial injustice. Gun violence in our own city is running rampant. Help us work out your will on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Your word says that you will supply all our needs according to your riches. You know exactly what we need today. But today we boldly ask, that you help Crystal Barrett heal from her broken arm. And we also pray that you will help her and the doctors decide what to do with the tumor that's in her bone. Our sister Peg has had gallbladder surgery. We pray that you will help her heal. We pray that you'll be with Tom Weida as he is in rehab at Raybrook. We lift up Mike Hookwater's mother, who's had COVID and is now re recovering. We pray that you will help Miles Heisman and help his leg to heal from being broken in two places. We lift up Becky Vanderwood's father, who's had surgery for a blood clot in his heart. We lift up Esther Coster, who's had low red blood cell count. We pray that the doctors will find the cause and that she will heal. We praise you, O oh God, that Penny Prime's recent scan has revealed that her cancer is stable. We pray that she will have a lessening of her cancer We pray for healing from surgery for Terry Barnes. We lift up Jayla Owens, whose son Kai passed away unexpectedly. We lift up Bonnie's sister, Marsha. We lift up Jaquan Doris. Stephanie Vanderzee's dad. And we also lift up Brenda Leggett and Willie Sawyer, whose home burned. Father, forgive us our debts. Search our hearts to see if there's any wicked way in us. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in us. As we forgive our debtors, O oh God, this is hard. Help us to forgive. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we ask for your help to be victorious in the face of temptation. And save us from the evil that is in the world. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. Father, we worship you as you are seated on the throne above every kingdom of this earth. We choose to serve you today.
My brothers and sisters, let us close this prayer of God's people by saying once again the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, and verses 18 through 20. The rabble with them began to crave other food, and again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we've lost our appetite. We will never see anything but this manna. Tell the people, Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten or twenty days, but for a whole month until it, until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? This is the word of the Lord. The psalm reading today is Psalm 75. We praise you, God. We praise you, for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob, who says, I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. This is the word of the Lord. The book of Numbers gets overlooked, partly because it has a really boring name, which is a shame. In the Hebrew tradition, the book's name is Bamidbar, which means in the wilderness. And it's an epic travel log about Israel's journey through the desert on their way to the land promised to Abraham. Now, this pilgrimage should only take about two weeks on foot. But instead, it takes them about 40 years. That's crazy. It's practically half of someone's lifetime. Yeah, it's a very long camping trip with lots of interesting stories. But let's remember, it's most helpful to back up and start with how this book is designed. Right. So the book is broken up into five sections. There are three wilderness locations broken up by two road trips that link all the pieces together. The first wilderness section is Mount Sinai, right here on the map. And then in the second section, they travel to a region called Paran. A whole bunch of things happen here in the wilderness of Paran. And then in this fourth section is Israel's road trip to Moab. The book ends with a large section in the wilderness of Moab, right across the Jordan River from the Promised Land. Now, through all of these sections, the storyline just flows like a gripping dramatic movie. Everything starts great, but then the trip goes horribly wrong, and it all ends with the final redemptive moment, the surprising act of God's grace. So let's jump into this story. It all begins at the wilderness at Mount Sinai, and we've become really familiar with this mountain. Yeah, if you remember, Israel came here after Egypt, and they formed a covenant with God here, got the Ten Commandments here, built the tabernacle here, and they've been at this mountain for one full year. And now they take a census to number the people as they prepare to leave. Right, and they're given these instructions for how to organize all those people in the camp. God's presence in the tabernacle, and then the tribe of Levi and the priests around it, 
and then the rest of the tribes around them. And this pattern, it's this visual symbol for how God's holiness is at the center of their existence as a people. And they're told that when the cloud of God's presence moves, they're to pack up and travel with it. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant is carried by the Levites out in front, and then the tribe of Judah, and on and on. And this order is also a symbol for how God's holy presence is their leader and guide through the wilderness. We begin the second section of the book with enthusiasm as they leave Mount Sinai and travel up to Paran. God's with them, everything's organized. This is gonna be great. But it's not great. After just three days on the road, the people are complaining about their hunger and thirst, and then even Moses' brother and sister start bad-mouthing him in front of all the people. Not a great start. But now we're into the third section, the wilderness of Paran. This is where they send the 12 spies to scout out the promised land. Two of those spies come back and they're really optimistic. But the other 10 are freaked out and they don't trust God and they go around saying, we're gonna get annihilated in there. And so they start a mutiny and they try to appoint a new leader who's gonna take all the people back to Egypt. And so basically they are refusing to go into the promised land and God honors their choice. He says that this generation is going to wander for 40 years and die in the wilderness and only their kids will get to enter the promised land. You know, this story here gets brought up many times in the Bible by different authors. Yeah, and and it always serves as a reminder that while God remains faithful to his people and his promises, he will honor their choices. He'll, He'll let them waste their whole lives if they choose to live in rebellion. Okay, so the trip's been a disaster so far. And it gets worse here in this fourth section as they're traveling to Moab. Even Moses has a moment of rebellion and is disqualified from entering the promised land. Then there's another rebellion among the people that results in this snake attack. And what makes all these rebellions even worse is that every step of the way, God has been providing. He's been offering forgiveness. He's been giving them food and water and this crazy stuff called manna. Yeah, what is that stuff? Yeah, no no idea. But in spite of all this, they keep complaining and they say that they wish they had died in slavery in Egypt. If I was God, I would just give up on these guys. You would think. But that's what makes this story in the final section so surprising. Israel has just arrived in Moab and the king of Moab, he's freaked out that this huge group of people is traveling through his land. So he hires this pagan sorcerer named Balaam to pronounce curses on them. This guy means business. Yeah, and so Balaam, he says, okay, I'm gonna pray to the Hebrew God and let's see what happens. And three different times he attempts to curse them, but each time he finds that he can utter only blessing. Most surprising is the last blessing where he prophesies that out of Israel will rise a victorious king. And this king is somehow gonna be connected to God's promise to Abraham to bless all nations through this family. So here's Israel rebelling down in the camp, totally unaware that up in the hills, God is protecting and even blessing them. The book ends here in Moab. Israel's getting ready to go into the promised land. They count up everyone again, just like at the beginning. They're leaving the old generation behind, including Moses. But before they leave Moses, he gives them his last words of warning and wisdom. And that speech is what the next book, Deuteronomy, is all about. Good morning. My name is Shannon Jamal Hallamans, and I am the pastor of worship at Oakdale Park Church, just a mile away from Sherman Street. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here with you this morning and to delve into God's word together. As Pastor Jen said last week, the context of this morning's passage, like that from Leviticus, is removed from our present context by layers of distance. But as we wade in, I think you'll come to see that the distance between the circumstances in which the children of Israel found themselves in the desert living on manna and the circumstances in which we find ourselves in this present moment, isolated physically, connecting virtually, while they differ in time and space, are not all that far from each other. Our passage in Numbers began by saying, the rabble with them began to crave other food. The phrase, the rabble with them, is referring to the people who joined the Israelites as they journeyed from Egypt to the land of Israel. Now, it might be easy to point fingers here and say that the rabble or those people were obviously the problem. But notice that God doesn't take issue with the cravings of the rabble. God takes issue here with the children of Israel. We hear that in the same sentence when we read, again, the Israelites started wailing. 
Complaining was becoming a pattern for Israel. They point to the variety of food that they had in Egypt. Remember the salad, the fruit, the baba ganoush. They were entertaining themselves with memories of Egypt, memories that neglected to reflect on the big picture and instead just focused on the tabletops. And they fell into the trap of thinking that what they needed was more than what God was providing for them, that God was selling them short. They remembered how good the food was in Egypt, but they forgot the provision of God. Note that while all of this is going on, in the verses that we skipped over this morning, Moses is experiencing his own crisis. He's not good at delegating, and he is bringing his own complaints to God, complaints about the load he's carrying, complaints about how ungrateful the children of Israel are, complaints about just how difficult his job is. Moses was trying to do too much and he was doing a lousy job at it, at leading the people through this time of crisis. Moses likely wasn't communicating with them well or listening to them well. And as a result, they felt like they had no say in what was happening to them. They were frustrated. And if we listened to their pleas, I think we would say that they had pretty much a right to be. So in their angst, they readily admitted, all we see is manna. And they wondered aloud and loudly, is this it? Is this what we left Egypt for? Ultimately, the source of their complaints was not the manna, but how powerless they felt, like there was nothing they could do to change their circumstances. Their time in the desert had killed their appetites. They felt vulnerable. They were mad. They were filled with anxiety and with little trust that the days ahead were going to be any better. This is how they ended up entertaining romanticized images of Egypt in their mind. As the text reads, they rejected the Lord who was among them. The children of Israel couldn't recognize that God was at work among them because their circumstances had eclipsed their vision of God. But we don't know what that's like, right? We don't know what it's like to have our world turned upside down, to have to learn a new way to live, to feel isolated, to complain, to feel anxious, to lose our appetites. Well, maybe we do know what that's like. Living in the time of COVID-19 has revealed so much for me. I've come to see just how much I rely upon seeing people upon being in their presence, absorbing their energy through laughter, through worshiping together. And I've come to know what it's like for people like my grandparents, people who talk about the good old days. When I find myself saying things like, remember when we could walk into a store without a face covering? Or remember when we went and saw movies in the theater? Remember what it felt like to have people over to our house? Those were the days. But memory can play tricks on us because memory can be selective. Like when my children were small and my son was obsessed with turning his sister, sister's Barbie dolls into guns and pretending to shoot her with them. My mom would say, oh, you and your siblings never did anything violent like that. I think that was her selective memory. And what we heard in this morning's text was that memories can be used for our benefit or for our detriment. We can remember the stories of what God has done in our lives and we can share them. Or we can remember the times when we felt like God wasn't there. Times when we needed God and we felt like God didn't show up for us. Deanna Smith reminded me of a song by Sarah Groves when she asked me to preach on this text. The song is called Painting Pictures of Egypt. And in it, Grove sings about what it's like to look at the past through rose-colored glasses, overlooking the things we don't want to see and honing in, focusing on those things that we do. 
There's this line in the song that I think captures this idea well. Grove sings, I was dying for some freedom, but now I hesitate to go. I am caught between the promise and the things I know. What is familiar becomes comforting to the point that when God calls us to experience something better, something more, we can reject it in favor of dwelling in the familiar. Like Israel, we can become so preoccupied with images of our own rendering that we neglect to recognize the ways that God is moving among us. Like Israel, we can long for what is familiar instead of what is better. And like Israel, we can lose our appetites for God's kingdom, for God's justice, for God's righteousness, because our vision has become so eclipsed by our present circumstances that we fail to feel God's presence among us. Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount that our love for God and the power of God at work in our lives should be most evident when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances. Not the good days, the bad days, because that, frankly, is what sets us apart as God's people. Not how we treat those people who are nice to us, but how we treat those people who are terrible to us. Not how we live when things are going really well, but how we live when things aren't. And the good news this morning is that that is precisely how God worked for Israel. God heard them because whether they could recognize it or not, God was still moving among them and readying himself to reply to their cries for help. We read in verse 18 that God asked Israel to consecrate themselves, to prepare themselves for God's response to their cries. And boy, is he gonna respond to them. God says to them, now I, the Lord, will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five or 10 or 20, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Yikes. First, that must have terrified them. I get terrified just reading that. Second, God sort of comes off like a jerk here. One commentator I read wrote, God judges complaining Israel with a blessing or blesses them with a judgment. It's hard to tell. But no worries. God is definitely not a jerk here. God is a loving parent. And like a parent who patiently listens to the complaints of their child until they can respond with intentionality and with care, God does just that. God provides meat for Israel. And we don't read it here, but later in Numbers, we see that God gives them water and meat in the form of quail, showing us that even in the wilderness, God can and does provide. God provides Moses with a system to delegate leadership responsibilities among the people, and God gives Israel meat. Does God get angry with Israel? Yes. Does God wield immense power to harm Israel in that anger? No. God can and does provide. And while God is angry at Israel for their insolence, God does not reject them. God does not banish them from God's presence. God shows love for them by sticking with them, by answering their prayers, by continuing to move among them. Did Israel get what they want exactly the way they wanted it? No. But did Israel get what they needed and in the process receive a reminder of just how powerful and strong their God is and just how powerful and strong God's love is for them? Yes, most certainly. God cannot be managed or manipulated or contained. I can't help recall that part in the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, 
where Mr. Beaver is describing Aslan to a young Lucy. Those of you who are familiar with the book and with that character will recall that Aslan is a lion and a sort of representation of God in the story. When Lucy hears that Aslan is a lion, she asks, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. That's what we see in this morning's text. A God who hears the cries of the people. A God who lives among the people. And a God who responds to their cries for help with justice, with mercy, and with grace. When we find ourselves in the wilderness, God is among us. When we cry out, God hears us. When we find ourselves in need, God responds to us. As we read in those images that God paints for us in other parts of the Bible, in the Torah, God's arm is not too short to save, and God's nose is long, which is an image of God's patience for us. There's a lot of judgment in the book of Numbers. But as those who know the fullness of God revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, fully human and fully divine, we don't need to fear that judgment. Justice has been served. Jesus was crucified, so we never have to be. In the video that we watched about the book of Numbers, just before this message, the narrator pointed out that the people in the book of Numbers see that God's justice is transformed into a source of life that brings healing to people. God is faithful, but God does not force us to be faithful in response. God allows us to experience the consequences of our decisions, just like any good parent, to learn from them. Because like Israel, God has freed us. God has delivered us. And part of that freedom is the freedom to make mistakes and also the freedom to choose God above all else. And because of this, we have the freedom to give God praise. As we heard in this passage and in Psalm 75, God is near. When we are attentive to that nearness, there are some pretty incredible stories that we can share about what God is doing in our lives. Stories that we can share with others so that they might come to recognize Christ as their savior, the way that we know Christ. And we can rest assured because God judges with equity and with mercy and with grace. The words of Psalm 75 verse three still ring true. When the earth and all its people quake. It is God who holds its pillars firm. In July, uh, Julie Vienemann, one of my sisters in Christ at Oakdale Park Church, shared her testimony in our worship. Five weeks later, we said goodbye to Julie as her body was laid to rest after a battle with cancer. But Julie's testimony the story of what God had done in her life was not laid to rest. I want to share a little bit with you of what Julie said that day. She said, by the age of 20, I was fatherless. At 23, I became semi-paralyzed in a car accident. And by 27, my mother had died too. I had cancer at 44 and at 66. My husband, Ryan, also had cancer twice. What a sight we were. We looked like people who had been forgotten by their God. But looks aren't everything. We were confident that our God had called us as his people. We truly lived by faith and not by sight, because what a sight we were. We believed that our God had redeemed us and was turning all of our sorrows and misfortunes to our good. We held his promise that he would le never leave us and never forsake us, and with each crisis that we went through, what faith could show us over and over again of God's presence and God's presence with us became our true sight. 
five years ago when I was really struggling as a parent. I felt pretty alone. There weren't many people that I could talk to who would just listen without trying to fix things for me. But that's what I needed, was someone to listen, someone to offer some understanding and some encouragement. And Julie did that for me. We'd gone to church together for 20 years and were never particularly close until that moment when I found myself wandering in a desert, so to speak. Julie was there. She listened to me. She prayed with me. She reminded me who I am and who God is. Through Julie, God was able to help me resist despair, resist entertaining images of the good old days in my mind, and turn my focus back to God's strong and loving presence in my life. Because Julie recognized the ways that God is at work and trusted in God's provision and was able to share that with me. As we leave this virtual space of worship today, I want to leave you with these three things. First, remember the truth about who you are and whose you are. You belong to God. God has called you by name. You are their child. Second, I want to encourage you to take a step back. Try to see the big picture, to recognize what God is doing to see the movements in your life where God has been there in the ups and in the downs, that you may come to recognize God's purposes, to see your place in them, to remember that God is always near. And finally, seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness because God is just and God will provide Never lose your appetite for that provision. Thirst for it, and you will be filled. Let us pray. Mighty God, we come to you this morning grateful because we know that both you are strong and all-powerful and mighty, and you are also loving and concerned and caring for our every need. Lord, our circumstances can overwhelm us. They can block our vision of you. They can make us feel like we're alone. They can make us feel like we're not being provided for. God, clear our vision. Help us to focus our eyes on you, on the ways that you're moving, the ways that you're providing, the ways that you are seeing fit, that every one of our needs is met. Maybe not in the way that we would have chosen God, but in the way that is for our good and for the flourishing of your people. God, we love you and we trust you. And we're so thankful for the gifts that you've given us in this church, in your word, in prayer, in all the ways that we can be in relationship with you, God. Help us not to take them for granted. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of our only Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.